show. Wow, look at this. That the is Mortlock. Fantastic. I actually really like this one. I've never had this. Again, I'm, a, really I'm an amateur. So I have what they have at Costco. Whatever they have at Costco, Costco. Um, like, is, is what I have. Well, I think Costco like has a Kirkland. fairly big col- like selection, though. No? no, what I mean by Costco is like Kirkland. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean, you amateur. Drink Kirkland whiskey? Okay. I didn't even know Kirkland made whiskey. And they do. They do. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's not bad. I have a bottle of it at home. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> I, I got it. I got to try that. So I'm I got to no, have this on the show. So don't. I'm no, now I'm embarrassed. Now I'm embarrassed. But you know, I didn't have any alcohol till, till I was 30. I'm a late comer to this. Like, You're a late bloomer, huh? I'm a late bloomer for sure. So were you like, yeah. um, were you kind of like a goody two shoes growing you up? You know, I was very much a goody two shoes. I had like, yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm very much. You were like I a straight never, arrow? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I did everything by the book. By the I was book, like you every never, Asian never American. Never experimented with like substances. Never drank. Never done anything. Never like that. drank till I was thirty. Never even had so much as a puff on a cigarette. Really. To this day. Okay. Yeah. Any anything I've inhaled has been secondhand smoke. Well, I, I went I, to Berkeley too, so you know how mm, you know how hard yep, that is. Yep, yeah. Yep. 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 You know. Well, cheers, George. Thank cheers. you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. We are drinking the Mortlock 16. Ooh. It's good, right? It's good. Please I like do this. not tell me this is not as good as the Kirkland brand whiskey. This is much better. Okay. The are Kirkland, you sure about that? I, I, I promise you. I mean, the Kirkland's not bad. You know, Kirkland does a good job, but it's nothing like this. It's that fine like, Kirkland whiskey. Fine. <laughs> oh, man. But, um, like, but I actually admire that about you um, because where I grew up, like... To not be a goody two shoe yeah. was like the mainstream. Oh. So you would it would take balls to be the goody two shoe. Really? You know what I'm saying? You know that's funny because yeah. it's the opposite of what it's how the opposite I grew of what you would yeah. think because usually they think the social pressures try to make you yeah. right. But like the social pressures where I grew up really, you know, lent itself to like kind of you know being like disobedient, you know, yeah. you know, rebelling and you know doing stupid things as a kid. Yeah. And uh, so I, re- I actually admire that about you, that you kind of went your whole life without even like doing, like even having a puff of a cigarette. It's interesting because, you know, yeah, I mean, I did everything kind of like by the book as it was handed to me. Were you ever curious you know? though? Like, I mean, hey, what does a cigarette taste like? Or what is, what is marijuana? What is marijuana no, like? No, honestly. You, it, never, it was never no, even curious. No. And, 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 and if I were to be totally honest, I think maybe I'm just slightly more curious about marijuana than I, than I am about tobacco. Like I have zero interest in tobacco and that's not because I had a negative sort of like experience with it or anything like that. Or my parents, nothing. I just have zero interest in it. Is that because, um, marijuana actually might have some uh, health uses, you know, because there's a lot of conversation yeah, right? about now, marijuana, right? yeah, yeah. pain management, mm-hmm. um, all sorts of things, right. Anti-inflammatory, and so, right. Is yeah. That thing? Yeah. So there's a lot of conversation about it, especially in, you know, healthcare, right. Which is the, the, mm-hmm. the field that I'm in. And so now I'm just like slightly curious, but I've never, and, and I went to, I went through four years of going to Berkeley, even longer of living in Berkeley. Cause I lived in Berkeley for, for a little bit after I graduated and I just never, never, but were Not people were people around you like going in, or you just weren't Ish. in that crowd? I think I think it was both, right? I, I think the people that I hung around with were definitely more straight shooters for sure, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then combined with the fact that I was just not curious, like I just had no no curiosity to it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm definitely I think I'm definitely an outlier. Even where I grew up, like I'm definitely more of a straight shooter than a lot of my other peers. Well, you yeah. mean straight shooter in the sense that you're just a straight arrow. Right? Yeah, in the sense that I, I was the guy that, um, you know, that, 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 that my friends, their parents wanted their kids to be friends with, right? And <laughs> even kid. to this day, no, even to this day when I go out, like <laughs> some of our mutual friends, right? Some, mm-hmm. some, some people that you and I both know, like I think, you know, a lot of times I go out with these friends and they're like, hey, our wives only let us out because they heard you're coming. Right. Yeah, I know. I know exactly. Which means, what you're about. yeah. Which means, all right. If George is going to be there, it's not going to be too crazy. There's going to be a, like, like he'll be the somebody, voice of reason. Yeah, the, I've never even been drunk. I've never to been drunk day? to this day. I've never been drunk. I don't. I don't know. You're like an alien right now. I, I'm an alien. I am. I know. I'm a. I'm a 44 year old American Chinese American guy in Shanghai. 
right? Uh-huh. I mean, think about that. Like, so we're gonna so, have to change that. I'm gonna change that. <laughs> today. We got drunk. <laughs> yeah, today. <laughs> no, but um, yeah. So I'm, I'm to this day, I'm still that guy that like a lot of my friends are like, hey, yeah, my our wives let us out because you're here. Yeah, I need yeah. I need more of those friends. Do you? Yeah, which is like this is what's so <laughs> great about having a format like this is that. Me and you, and I, I was really excited to have you on the show. Yeah. And, you know, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Me too. And, you know, what's great about this is, like, we get to sit down and actually have a conversation and really get to know each other yeah. and share, share some ideas. Whereas, if not, like, when we were kids, I would we would never have been friends. Yeah, probably not. You know, we kind of ran in completely do t- different types of, like, you know, crowds and circles. Now I'm curious. Yeah. What, 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 what was your childhood like? What did you... Um, what kind a of kid lot were of you? substance abuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of substance abuse when I was a kid. Okay. But that was like the norm. You yeah. Know? Like so, alcohol. Sorry. You don't have to say, I'm no, just, no, 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 no. I've said it before on this show. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of alcohol for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I had my first cigarette like at a young age and, um, yeah, but like I, uh, yeah, a lot of alcohol, a lot of weed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've dabbled in uh, some other, like, you know, kind of psychedelics, things yeah, like that. Yeah. But nothing like truly hardcore, like, yeah. you know, like I've never, like I've never cocaine, tried that crack like, cocaine or heroin yeah. or something. That was never like um, even a thought. Yeah. You know, but, but like the more recreational stuff. Yeah. That, you know, is more typical, yeah. stereotypical. Like yeah. all that was like just all part the time. of, part of, yeah, part of the norm. Yeah, yeah. Part of the norm. Yeah. Especially in the circles I ran around. And, you know, I, I grew up in the suburbs in New Jersey and in the suburbs, just like probably with any suburbs in the States, yeah. you know, kids get bored and then they, they look for things to do. And usually it's not very productive or healthy things <laughs> that yeah. they find yeah. you know, to get themselves into. Well, now that I look back on it, you know, it's interesting because I think there's always the element of like, and, and it'd be interesting to get your take on this also as a Chinese American guy, right? Like, mm-hmm. but there's always this element of what we should do. Mm. Right. And I think especially as, as Asian folks growing up, like ABCs growing up in the States, right? I think there was this always like layer of our parents' expectations or, you know, um, the, the kind of story or narrative of what we should do. And that was always a big thing. And, and, and I'm curious about whether maybe I just succumbed to that more, you know, maybe I was just like, man, I, I need to do this, right? I need to follow the book. I need to, that was your gospel. I wonder, well, you are, okay, what little I know about you, but it seems from uh, the outside, yeah, it seems you are the shining, successful example of that. Oh, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> well, look at you now. I mean, you're the chief of mental health at United Family, right? You're also the um, president of the Shanghai International Mental Health Association. Yeah. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, that is like your shining success story of um, like what... Asian parents would want from their child, right? Uh, like, right? maybe there's a, maybe a there's a veneer, like, no, well, see, I'm not a physician. So, so there, there's also a, there's something Okay, so there, you think that, so you think right? that matters? I mean, you should have been a fly on the wall. I think it does, because you, sh- you should have been a fly on the wall when, when I told my parents that I wanted to study psychology. What was their response? Um, I think my mom's response was something like psychology what does that mean? Like, you're going to, you're going to, I can tell who's crazy. Why do you need to study? I can, I can tell who's crazy. He's crazy. She's not, I can tell. Like, what do you have to go to school for? What is that about? What, 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 what even does psychology mean? Right. And it was, I think the fear because, because my parents used to say, man, I hope they don't, I hope they don't listen to this. My par- but my parents used to say, look, George, you have complete freedom to be anything you want to be as long as it's a doctor, lawyer, or businessman. Right, And I think to them, they really genuinely felt like they were giving me freedom, right? But um, obviously to me, that was a really narrowly defined definition of it. But, you know, it was their fear, right? They're immigrant. Like I think, are your parents immigrants yeah. too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like many of us ABCs of a certain generation, I think, you know, we all come from immigrant families who spent a lot of their time in fear. And that fear was something like, am I going to make it in this new place? Because we probably left the old place kind of 
you know, under a complicated history, right? Mm-hmm. For complicated reasons, having to do with pain and, and stuff like that. And so now going to this new place, am I going to make it in a, in a place that does not look like me, that does not speak my language? And now I'm going to have children. Are they going to make it? And I'm really, really afraid. And that causes this, these immigrants to like clamp down and say, and to be pretty narrow, like there's no room for like trial and error. There's no room for experimentation. Yeah. You know, you just got to go with like what you know You got to go with what you know works. It's like when I went to college, when, when I was preparing to go to college, right? The people around me, a lot of, the, a lot of my peers were like, hey, we're going to do these college um, visitations. We're going to set up these visits and just kind of go see what they're like, see if I like it. And when I brought that idea up to my parents, they were like, what? It was like the most alien thing ever. Because they're like, why do you need to go visit? What does that matter? You're going to go to the best college mm. that you get into. And by best, we mean whatever U.S. News and World Report says, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Like the ranking, yeah. not the best in terms of like the weather or the programs or like Like that all those no, other variables don't matter. It's just whatever is ranked the highest. Do not matter. So what's the point of going to visit as if that's going to have any wow. impact, right? Wow. And And it was almost like also this thing where like, you know, I think college is the first time that a lot of us, at least for me, right? Like I was going to spread my wings and sort of be my own person, right? And and I think my parents coming from a more traditional sort of Chinese or Asian background were kind of like, what, you, you know, the, the idea of where you want to go to college, like that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is where are we as a family going with mm. this? Right. So the definition of the word, quote unquote, I was like different. Like I thought of I as in me, myself, George, like in my own skin and in my own body. And they thought of it very differently. They thought of the word George or I as being much more connected to this whole group. Right. So the fact that you, George, would solely choose where you want to go to college is kind of like. Like, like that was speaking, an alien idea. Yeah. You're it was like a great. selfish idea. You're selfish. Yeah. Or just like completely foreign. Yeah, but isn't that the, isn't that one of the biggest differences between Western and Asian culture? Though I, I feel so. like Asian culture in general, yeah, is more of that community mentality, that, oh, totally. that group mentality. Right? Yeah, think about the mask stuff, yeah. right? Back in the U.S., right? Yeah. You have all these people, or you know, not everybody, thankfully, but you know, a significant subsegment of the population just not wearing masks. Well, what do you chop that up to? You think that's just like individualism, like? Um, like I'm my own person, don't tell me what to do kind of mentality or... Yeah, I mean, I think there's this ethos, right, for us as Americans that's written into our... Like Jefferson wrote it into our Declaration of Independence, right? The, The pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like these are like tenets of our culture that are written into our very DNA and and anything that would impinge upon our liberty, upon our individual pursuit of something called happiness... Um, like it, 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 you, you cannot impinge upon that. Like thou shalt not interfere with that. Right. And, and here we are, I, I think not every culture historically has felt that way, has placed such a value on individual happiness, whatever that means. Right. Or an individual's life or liberty. Right. The concept is different. So like, um, I think for the for for a lot of Americans, the fact that even though they can cerebrally cerebrally understand why wearing a mask might be important to public health or something like that, it is me as an individual as a person willingly accepting a limitation, mm. right? And that feels anathema to a lot of people. That feels like they prickle against that, like no, 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 that's not right, mm-hmm. right? I. George should not be, should not have to sacrifice anything, right? Yeah. For somebody yeah. else. Yeah. They should say, take care of them and me, I take care of me. So if you get sick, you get, you get sick. I'm sorry, I'm not wearing a mask. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know, exa- yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. But do you feel like it can go, it gets taken too far sometimes? Or it gets yeah. used as like kind of this atomic bomb in yeah. terms of any sort of like stopping any sort of discussion in its tracks, totally. right? Totally. Like... Like my freedoms, my personal liberties, boom. And once you say those words, it's like, oh, like hands, hands up off. in the air. Yeah. Can't, can't talk any further. There's nothing else like you can do. Yeah. Because once you bring up those terms about freedom and liberty, all of a sudden it's like if you're like arguing or d- having a debate about these things, 
if you're debating on the other side of that, it's all of a sudden then it's it, you're put in this, you're framed yeah. in this uh, as like you're against, you're against freedom, you're against yeah. liberty, you're against yeah. these things. And then all of a sudden it just stops any discussion in its tracks. Oh, you're so right. I totally agree with you. It's like these, um, I don't know what you call it, but it's like, it's, it's like a card that you pull, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as you pull that card, it stops any sort of intellectual discourse, yeah. right? And, and, and it's just not, it, 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 you know, I think COVID is bringing to light the fact that the world is operating on a whole different level. Right, we have this virus. It's literally in the air. It spreads like wildfire. Yeah, you know, it may have started here in China, in Wuhan, but come on, we live in the 21st century, right? Nothing is so boundary to one place, yeah. right? It's gonna spread, right? No matter how much you, and it's not because, and, and, and I do have issue perhaps with some of China's early efforts, right? And in, 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 in terms of the, the way that, you know, the Chinese health authorities chose, for example, to, um, you know, silence some of the voices of the initial medical staff that, that found that this was a thing back mm. in Wuhan, right? And, and then there's a lot of fear. But I think that after that, China's response to this has largely been um, appropriate, you know, and, and granted, like, I think China's in a unique space, right? We have a very particular type of governance here. Mm -hmm. We have a particular type of society. But I think it's really interesting because Chinese people in general have been much more accepting of the limitations. And, and part of that has, has been because they have to, right? Like I remember being interviewed by the BBC once about, hey, like how did you guys in China move so quickly to online education and working from home? And I'm like, well, part of the reason is because you showed up to work one day and there's a padlock on the front door. So you just got to suck it up and do it. There's no mm. like conversation, quote unquote, about how we're going to do this. It's mm. like you do it or you don't have a job. So let me know. Right. Mm. And, and it's part of it's that. But the other part, I think, too, is that there's much more of an understanding that, hey, we're all going to have to do this. Right. If we if we wish to come out of this like pandemic. Yeah. Right. We're all going to have to bite the bullet a little bit and suck it up. Yeah. And I think there's something in the American ethos, you know, or culture that we bristle against that. We don't think that's right, that we as an individual have to suck it up. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because then, I mean, I think they always, Americans in general, I don't know, maybe they frame things in, in terms of like a slippery slope. Like, yeah. oh, if, well, if we, like, you know if we kind of give this ground, even though it's like just a little bit, yeah. you know, what's going to happen later? You're what right. is that going to lead to? And then what is that going to lead to? First the it? mask, then the yeah, then whatever. This, and then that, yeah. you know, so they start hypothesizing or, or, you know, thinking about all these like worst case scenarios yeah. instead of addressing the issues one matter at a time yeah. and being like, okay, well, what do we need to do right now? What's immediate and what, what makes sense? Yeah. Um, Instead, they go on to like worst case scenarios, right? Yeah. And these abstract ideas of like slippery like slopes. Yeah, slippery yeah. slopes. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and I think that's sort of like the kind of fear that takes hold, right? Instead of going, "Hey, you know, this is a virus. We know how viruses operate. We know how they spread, and we know. I mean, it is. It's not new that wearing masks contain the spread of viral epidemics. That's not new at all." Mm -hmm. Right, Spanish flu, for example, like, but but not just Spanish flu, SARS. Like, part of the reason why I think masks took on here is be, in China is because we went through SARS and yeah. there's masks were a thing, yeah, already. Yeah, masks were a thing because of the pollution. Like, you you know, well, even before COVID, people were wearing masks. Like, you know, the air some bad. people, yeah, yeah, were wearing masks already. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I spent three years, me and my family, in Beijing, right, where we wore masks like most days. Yeah, you know, it's like bringing an umbrella if you think it's going to rain. You know, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and so we didn't see it as so much of an impingement upon individual liberty. We saw it only as, well, you know, it's up to you whether or not you want to breathe something in yeah. that you don't want to, you know? But, like, where do you draw the line, right? Yeah. Like, in this, like, I think these ideas, these, like, things that would, you would think would be, like, just self-evident become these abstract ideas of, like, impingement on liberties. Like, yeah. if wearing a mask is impinging on liberties, then isn't wearing a seatbelt in a car? Sure. Isn't or isn't or, or clothing and clothing? General? Yeah, like you can't walk out naked. You'll be yeah. arrested, right? You will. Yeah, and it's not necessarily about decency. It's also about well, I don't want to sit where your bare butt has sat 
either yeah. <laughs> right but no one, know no one talks about that yeah no one no one puts up a fuss the fact that there is laws yeah that you have to wear clothing in public yeah and i think and you that's know, your body right it's your, exactly that's your very that's, that's your what very everyone body. says like this is my body my choice right yeah well like that, that has other connotations but sure but my body my choice well wearing clothing wearing a seatbelt and there's probably a ton of other things and and you're right i think this is a perfect example of something in that that most people are not thinking of in a logical way right they're only reacting out of fear the fear of the slippery slope, like you said, the fear that, um, or the unwillingness to give, right? To be, to, to appear weak. And I think that's a very interesting kind of concept too, is that I don't want to appear weak by wearing this mask. And that's what makes the mask different from pants, is that somehow I no longer, you know, connect the wearing of pants to weakness, but I'm connecting the wearing of a mask to some sort of weakness or fear mm -hmm. that I just don't like. And so I'm going to just like push away the concept of wearing a mask, even though it makes no sense. And even though I may not be a dumb person, I might be a perfectly reasonably intelligent guy, but I'm going to push that away. Oh, yeah. did you hear uh, just a few hours ago, the news broke out, Donald Trump I saw. and Melania, they have a, uh, they they're positive COVID. for COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I can't say I'm surprised. It's just a matter of time. Do you think it's real though, or do you think it's like a stunt he's pulling? And if there's, Good, there's, a, I mean, there's a little bit of me in the back of my mind that's like, he's doing this on purpose, just so that he can come out, like he's healthy, and just so he can come out and be like, I recovered, it's no big deal. See, I told you, COVID's no big deal. I recovered, I'm 70 something years old. I don't you know. There's know. a bit of me that feels like he wants Maybe to Maybe there's that. a little bit of that. I mean, you know, I will not pretend that I know <laughs> his mind. But I do think that, though, if anything about Donald Trump is that he has been eminently readable from the beginning. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted to kind of, kind of get your, <laughs> like, we don't need to get political Sorry. if you don't want to. But, but, uh, but I, I really was curious about like your take as a mental health expert, a doctor, and when you see someone like him. Or did you watch the debate, the first debate, or see the highlights, or hear about it at least? I saw highlights. I could not bring myself to watch the whole thing. Yeah, I so, must admit to you. So, like, what, what, what do you? What's your take on like what's going on, like mentally? You think it's just a game? It's tactics, or do you think it's some other deeper kind of something about his personality? Or I don't know. Like, what's your take on it? I mean, I hesitate to say, I hesitate to say on many levels. Number one, like I, I'm a clinician, right? And so we are really not supposed to be diagnosing or like sort of like going too far in terms of, um, you know, clinical commentary on a person that we don't have that kind of relationship fair, fair, with. Yeah. That having been said, like I said before, I think he's eminently readable. Like he's not that complex of a person. It, it, it appears, right? He's not so nuanced or layered. He puts it out there. Unless he's doing these things on purpose. Unless this is a character that, yeah. he's, that he's portraying on purpose. On purpose. And, but I think that the purpose is clear. He wants to win. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? At all and costs. At all costs. And to him, win is defined in a certain way. Right? Win is defined by me being in a certain position and my family being in that position, right? So hiring in my daughter and my like son-in-law and like whoever, right? My friends and, and my tribe into that, those positions, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that because that is the primary goal, like the ends justify the means, right? So I'm going to say whatever, I'm going to do whatever, as long as that final goal is achieved, you know? And I think that that's been it appears to be the kind of person that he's been from the beginning, you know? And so I can't fault him necessarily for like obfuscating himself or playing the political game in this overly sophisticated and nuanced way. I don't think he's that, it does not appear at least that he's that sophisticated or nuanced. He's quite clear. Mm -hmm. Now I don't, now myself, I don't support him politically, right? I sort of, you know, from the beginning have bristled, I think against his style. I tell a lot of people like he may have, he may have um, policies that maybe I agree with. I don't even know because it's been hard for me to get past the packaging. 
Well, you know, his actual policies are actually not even that much that revolutionary in, yeah. in, in, the, in the news, even and probably nothing even new. Well, all to, the headlines the, are always about like his antics or his tweets or sure. whatever. It's, yeah. it's hardly ever about his actual policy. It's about his style and yeah. the way that he engages. And I think a lot of people would call my sort of approach to this as like sort of non non substantive, but I can't get past his outer demeanor right like i don't even know if what you're saying makes sense because i just don't like you (laughs) right so i don't know that we can even get to that other conversation Uh you know Uh but um but yeah i mean uh, for but for him getting covid like i'm not surprised right i mean he um it's like about time right he's been doing all these rallies it's gonna be a matter of time he's a human being breathing air And really has not really been into masks or the people around him view masks as a weakness or are worried about the quote unquote optics of people in the West Wing wearing masks, right? So obviously it's just going to be a matter of time. And I think that that is really, really shameful in the 21st century and much too bad, right? That in the 21st century, with all that we know about viruses, about coronaviruses, which are a very understood class of viruses, right? I mean, with all that we know, the most advanced, um, economically advanced, scientifically advanced country in the world could not protect itself, right? Could Sorry, I, I say could not re- protect itself, was unwilling to protect itself, mm, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It could, it could have. It has it's the means not rocket to, science, yeah. right? A surgical mask is not rocket well, science. Well, you know, we did it here in China. <laughs> I mean, we did it, right? And we are over here very much a developing society, right? But, I mean, and around the world, yeah, right? I mean, we, we are at over 200,000 American deaths from this virus. That's what, 7 million contracted. Embarrassing, you know? Well, um, talking about the 21st century, yeah. Um, I want to take it back a little bit to something you mentioned when you were uh, talking about like when you first kind of, um, you know, confronted your parents about wanting to go into psychology. Um, Because, you know, obviously you're a mental health expert, chief of mental health at United United Family. So I want to talk about kind of like modern day um, threats to that, I guess. Mm. And also um, maybe just the idea of stigma, because when you when you talk when you yeah. said like your mother's response to me, automatically what came to my head as you were saying that was, well that's the very definition of the stigma, right? Like yeah. the fact that when you said mentioned psychology, your your mother was like, what psychology? That's not like a real thing. Like like exactly. why are you going into that? Like, but that's the very kind of I guess one of the roots of like why a lot of these mental health issues are a stigma is because people don't feel like yeah. it's a real thing. They feel like it's a character flaw or something yeah. rather than an actual illness, which it is. I but a lot of these things you, are. I love the way you put that because that's the ex- exactly the way that I describe it. When people talk about mental health difficulties, right, the, the stigma exactly comes from the fact that a lot of people say, you know, there's something wrong with you and your character. Like you're your weak. Person, you're weak. Yeah. yeah. That's why you have that. And we would never say that, or that's why you have that difficulty. We would never say that if somebody suffering from liver cancer or like skin cancer or whatever, mm. right? Or, or diabetes or any sort of, you know, other difficulty. Yeah. Right. But when it comes to something that we don't understand, Right, there's something that's not so direct. Is it the mind? Is it the brain? Is it the person? What is it? Is it this, the, the environment around them? What is it that, that has caused this disorder or this difficulty? Right, I don't know that I love the term disorder. But I think that a lot of mental health difficulties, just actually, just like a lot of physical difficulties, arise not just from one factor, but are actually multifactorial. But we don't understand it. Right. And so it's easy for us to say, oh, you're like that because you're weak. If you were just stronger, if you would just suck it up, if you were, if you had better character, right, um, then you wouldn't have that problem. And that's just so that that's too bad. And I'm very, very, um, I'm quite open in when I give talks and and seminars. But I, I recently wrote an article for Suicide Awareness Month, which is just September, right? So, so just this past month. Um, and I wrote an article sharing my own experience with suicidal ideation, 
right? Okay. Um, I was very, I was very open in the article, but I've always been, you know, as I spoke, that I have, I started this field, and by field I mean mental health field. I started this field as a patient first. Really? Before I became a clinician. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because of a lot of things. Like I went through a lot of, you know, difficult, traumatic kind of um, events. I struggled with difficulties in my mood and and, and depression, but I also um, have been suicidal in the past, you know, and, and, and I talk about it openly because I want, I want to destigmatize this phenomena. Right. I even want to dis- destigmatize these phenomena away from the concept of like diagnostic categories and mental illness. Right. These are just difficulties and experiences that people go through, even suicidal ideation. And just because somebody's fe- somebody feels suicidal, yeah, sometimes it means they have a mental disorder. Sometimes it doesn't. Right. Especially in this part of the world. Right. Suicide here. Um, is a complex thing. Like if you think about the kamikaze pilots of World, about pilots of World War II, right, who chose to end their life not mm-hmm. because they were depressed, right, or had a disorder, but because of some purpose that they felt required that necessitated that. Here in China, we have a whole we have Duanwujie, right, mm-hmm. a whole holiday um, celebrated in commemoration of a poet who killed himself to make an expression about where he felt his country was going and the sorrow and the angst that he felt about that, right? And he chose to end his life as a statement of that, right? Because he was a well-known figure. And now we, you know, the zongzi, the, you know, Mm -hmm. the things that we, you know, throw into the river because he threw him, he drowned himself in a river, right? And so we, so the the rice, the glutinous rice balls that are wrapped in, in leaves are done so uh, because the people would throw them into the river so that he could actually eat them before the fish did, right? Because the leaves protected it against the fish. So, I mean, we have here in this part of the world, I think a much more layered and nuanced view of like suicide, for example, right? That it's hardly ever me. talked about here. Though, it's hardly right? ever talked about because I think, and I wonder because, because I think that there's an idea from the West, right? That, Suicide means you're mentally ill, that you have a psychiatric problem, that if you think about it, you have a psychiatric problem. And by psychiatric problem, I mean institutionalized, like some sort of like, even in the way that we even talk about these issues here in China now, you know, as like xing li ji bing versus jing shen ji bing, like it's a very, it's a very stigmatizing way to talk about it. And when we think about Suicide, people immediately jump to like jingshen, psychiatric illness, right? Jingshen ji bing. And, um, and I don't know that it's always like that, right? And I think that many of my peers in mental health will probably like, <laughs> I'll probably get a lot of calls and complaints <laughs> about this. But I say, because, you know, you know I, I do think that suicide, obviously suicide is something that needs to be addressed, right? And that more and more now, Right, thinking about ending one's life is because we it, it is a marker of the fact that we need to change and we need to address something around this person's life. Right. But I want to destigmatize it. Right. Mm-hmm. Somebody feeling suicidal does not necessarily mean that they have a serious psychiatric illness, but it does mean that we need to pay attention to what's happening. But a, a lot of the time, what's happening with somebody suicidal is not so much a problem with them, but it's sort of also an issue with the environment around them. The society, the community, the environment around them also needs to be changed. And, and I think I want to take the conversation there, right? Like how could we talk about the communities and the families and the societies around people to care for people more so that they don't have to feel this way? So they don't have to feel alone. They don't have to feel like their only option is to kill themselves. A lot of people here in China and a lot of Asians um, in general who feel suicidal feel this way because um, they perceive themselves to be more of a burden to their communities, right, than, a, than, than they are a benefit, right? And we see this, you know, here in China, there's kind of two, like, uh, times of life in which we see suicide, um, 
suicide attempts spike. One is late adolescence, so 15, 16, 17, that, that sort of period. And the other is um, in the older population, like post-70. Right. And a, a lot of times, and, and, and for the post 70 folks, it's really because um, they perceive a lot of times they, they perceive themselves to be much more of a burden to their families and they mm -hmm. are benefit. Right. Like they're older. They may have limited mobility. Right. They're not working anymore. Maybe there's some health problems that are presenting a financial burden to the family. Right. There's a concept here that you have to take care of your older generation. Right. The nursing homes are not as much of a thing here. Right. They, they kind of see them a burden. And thankfully, that's becoming less and less the case as uh, China urbanizes more and more. But um, I think, you know, th th there still is this sort of like, I, you know, a lot of folks choose to attempt to end their life, not so much because they're depressed classically, but because they feel like I just don't want to be that burden anymore. Mm. You know, and yeah, it'll be an emotional burden because I died. But that would have happened anyway. Yeah. Right. And Whether at least that, that, that'll be temporary. Yeah. Know? And that'll be temporary. That'll go away. But like the financial burden, what if I'm such a financial burden for X or Y number of years that like, you know, now my kid has a hard time sending his own kid to school or like, you know, yeah. pro, like giving their own children the opportunities that they would have given because they're spending money on me. I, I would have to imagine like, you know, for, for people who are elderly or have health problems, I, I would have to imagine like the last thing they would want is to like leave their loved ones in this like state of like financial, like, um, you know, financial bankruptcy or well, like, or, you know, yeah. financial trouble, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, like that's the last way you want to go. Right. No. Yeah. That's the last way you want to, you, you want to go, you know, in a way where you feel like you've really helped, right. That you've really helped to elevate your family, you know, to, to a different style or standard mm -hmm. of living. You know, um, now, now the other end though, the late adolescence, I think it's, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of reasons why obviously adolescence is a emotionally tumultuous period, you know, period of life for anybody. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, the, the children here are under so much more pressure. I feel like yeah. than, than we were in, right? Like, oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. Right. Like the educational system here is just so competitive. It's very competitive. There's just so many people, so many kids. Yeah. If you think about the sheer number. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something like, I mean, there's millions, like probably something like millions and millions of, 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 of students taking the Gaokao every year, yeah. vying for a very limited amount of college spaces. And basically, right, you have the, the best colleges here. There's really only two, <laughs> Beida and Tsinghua, right? Yeah. There's really only two. Like those are the, and everybody in, and their mothers are shooting for that. Like the whole country of kids. The whole <laughs> country is shooting for that. I mean, these are just crazy standards. And the, the competition and the fact that you throw in there the one-child policy too, mm. right, for yeah. each family. It's easy for a child to feel like, I'm the hope of the family mm -hmm. that my achievements educationally are the um, it, it, it's the representation. It's the viable representation of my family's success. This is the way to show for my family to show the world that they have succeeded. All the burdens me. on me. Yeah. is for me to show them that I got into this school. And that's a lot. But the one-child policy is not really a thing anymore, right? That was no, before. no. But it only changed what, like two years ago? Was it? Two, was it yeah, two years ago? Just a really? few years. I mean, the I, I think that it was it was it was relaxed a little bit for um, people living in the countries in the rural areas, mm. right? Like if you were, it's kind of sexist, but in, in the rural areas, if your first child was a girl, you were allowed to quote unquote try again for a boy, mm. right? Because mm -hmm. the boy could carry on you know, do work and, and all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that was the case. And also in certain urban areas too, you were allowed to go for two, but generally speaking, it was a one child policy until pretty recently. Yeah. yeah. What are the, uh, do you know what the suicide rates are here in China? In America, I've heard it's as high as one, yeah. one out of 10 people. Like ten percent, ten percent of deaths are suicides. Um, I don't know about that. In America, it is one of the leading causes of death for adolescents. There are mo more people die from su like this is what I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, more people in the United States, more people die from su of suicide mm -hmm. uh, than murder. 
I think that that is probably true. Right. Mm -hmm. But like in the news, you'll hear about murders, but you won't really hear about suicides. No. No. Yeah. And again, I think because people, you know, look at suicide as an individual problem. Like that person was sick. Mm. Right. It's, it's not like, it's kind of like you don't even hear about cancer. Like you, you kind of do, but cancer is also like a, like a public health concern. Like how can we change things about the environment and things about our system to better take care of people with cancer? But you don't hear about that with suicide because there is again, like you said, the stigma that, you know, part of the problem at least is because that person was kind of like not able to just like yeah, bear right? the burden, right? That there was just something, um, you know, individually placed on that person. And, um, you know, I don't, while maybe obviously there's always individual factors that, that, that impact what's going on, what we're missing is, is, is what's happening in the family, what's happening in society, what's happening in the communication around uh, the community rather around that child where that person felt like their only option was to die. Why didn't that person see, why couldn't we as a society around that person show that there were some other options that were viable? You know? Well, you bring up, um, and I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And you bring up society. Have you ever, um, there's this term called a radical environmental mutation. Oh. Do you anything about that? Mm-mm. It's b- basically, um, it's the idea, right? If, okay, this is going to be, a kind of a long explanation, but yeah, yeah, yeah. bear with me. No, right? I'm, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> so, uh, so as humans, right, individuals, we look at time in as very short segments of time within our own lifetime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Decades, years, right. Very yeah. short. Yeah. Um, but when we're able to step back and look at the greater kind of span of time that goes be- beyond our lifetime. Yeah. We get to see like bigger patterns. Yeah. Happen, right. Yeah. And, and, and more like changes over a long course of time to human evolution, yeah. human genetics, uh, behavior, the way our bodies and brains are wired to um, interact with the environment around us. Yeah. So there's this idea called a radical environmental mutation, which basically um, from the beginning, basically, it's like from the Pleistocene era, which is like basically humans and prehumans have 99% of all human experience hmm. has been hunter-gatherer experience. Hmm. Hmm. 99, over 99% actually, yeah. has been hun- living as hunter-gatherers. And relatively recently, there was the agricultural revolution yeah. um, with the advent of agriculture and settlements and cities and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, but, Industrial revolution. Yeah, well, so I, I'm going to get to oh. that. But the agricultural revolution, very little thing, like, you know, like there was some kind of um, evolutionary changes a little bit that happened during then. But then when you talk about the biggest change, one of the biggest changes of recent time is really the Industrial Revolution. Mm. And that dates back only 200 years ago. Uh, so mm. that's really only, well, that's like four or five generations of people. Yeah. It's like yeah. nothing. It's, nothing. It's literally nothing. Yeah, it's a blink of an eye. Yeah, so obviously during that time, there has been no human real evolution or changes to the way we're or wired or our genetics or anything like that. Yeah. Yet our environments have completely, completely changed. Oh, totally. So what this idea is, is that we're actually still wired genetically, mm. uh, physiologically, mm-hmm. neurally. We're still wired for a different environment. For a completely different environment, yep. we're wired to be still to be hunter gatherers because ninety nine percent of our human experience has been that yeah. way. And we don't evolve that quickly. We don't. Right? Evolve. We, evolve, <laughs> we evolve very slowly. Yeah, very slowly relative to the exp- the way that information. Yeah. So now, all of a sudden, just a few generations ago, you go through industrial revolution. We're now we're living in this whole different modern society. So yeah. that's the radical environmental mutation. Where all of a sudden we're not ready for this our, yeah. our our bodies and minds are not built for this are not built to to be sedentary are not yeah. built to be indoors yeah. are not built to be sleep deprived and stressed at work yeah. and, and all these things or and so that's digitally just where you see, connected which is another or digitally yeah. or the technology is a whole different can of worms yeah. right where now in the recent years you see that spike generation after generation the uh, the rates of mental illness depression yeah. these things are are going up they're not yeah. going down and so it's like this idea of like we're just not built for this yeah and if you look at like modern day like aboriginal tribes 
Um, and there have been a lot of deep studies that go back decades where they're focused on like studying a lot of these tribes that live like secluded and their lives and the way they live are a lot, a lot more similar to like ancient hunter gatherer yeah. lifestyles. Yeah. And you basically see none of like obesity, you see none of diabetes, you don't see asthma, you don't see uh, cancer, depression, depression. you don't see these anxiety. things, mm-hmm. yeah, anxiety, suicide, these are basically non-existent in these societies. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not end all and be all, yeah. but it's interesting to look at that body of research and evidence and think about this whole idea Yeah. and being like, well, we're kind of like a fish out of water right now. Oh, definitely. Yeah, right. definitely. And I and I see that as we flail in sort of the internet age, mm. right? And sort of our relationship a lot of times to technology and social media use and, and social media particularly. And and I, I you know, I, I, I will admit that I have a certain type of relationship, right, with this and that I'm a clinician, right? And so I see people having a maladaptive relationship to technology and maybe addicted to social media and seeing the effects of social media use and on things like anxiety in adolescence or even in myself. Right. So, so I, I admit that it's a very particular kind of a, a perspective, but I, you're right. I don't think we have, we have evolved or developed, however you want to put it in a way that we can handle these things responsibly mm. and that we can understand its impact. Right. And I think that, um, this is a conversation that we have to talk about as society because you're getting at something. We have to acknowledge our weakness before we can appropriately decide what we're going to do. We have to acknowledge that we have, we don't have the tools, right? And we don't have that evolution or that development or however, when you, however you want to put it. And until we can ad- admit that first, and to admit that we don't know what we're doing and that we're out of control and ill-equipped, we can't, as a society, have a conversation on how to handle it, right? And I think that has a lot to do with mental health because I think that one of the primary sort of roadblocks to people, one of the primary things that prevent people from accessing support, right, emotionally, accessing support socially, um, is an inability or unwillingness to admit their own need, hmm. right? Admit that I don't know. I don't have what it takes. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that as Americans, we have, you know, something else that's written into our ethos is sort of this lone ranger, desperado mm. kind of like mentality, right? Yeah. Like the lone ranger riding off into the sunset. Tough guy, hero. Tough guy, I don't need nobody. Yeah. Right, I'm my own man. I don't need anything. Nobody's, I'm gonna, you know, all I need, you know, all I have is my horse and my gun and I'm, I'm out, mm. you know, I'm fending for myself. Me against the world. Me know? against the world. And and I love it, the Marlboro man, Marlboro man kind of like mentality. I, you know, I, I see it, but I think it is profoundly unhealthy because it's not true, right? It's like the disney version of the ending for boys, right? It's just not, it's just not reality. Mm. In reality, the reality is unless we, you know, learn to be well adjusted to our own weakness, we're not going to function well, <laughs> you know, we're going to become like we were just talking about Donald Trump getting COVID finally. And we all saw it was going to happen because, you know, he doesn't wear a mask, right? And he's sort of anti-mask and he's like, I'm not, you know, it's weak and I'm not doing that. Well, all right, but you're going to get infected. So what are some like possible solutions to that? You know, I think us as society have to change the messaging that we're sending. Mm. You know, I think us like machismo kind of, yeah, this thing we're like, you know, I don't, that, that, that strength is equated with not needing any help or support, right? That, 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 uh, that's a false connection. Like if, like, like I work for a healthcare company, United Family, right? We are a healthcare company. We are not a technology company. We are not a whatever company, right? And so if I, as a healthcare, you know, um, healthcare company and maybe a quite a, a mature and like respected one, right? But if I have an IT problem, 
I'm going to have to admit that I have an IT problem. Yeah. And because I'm a healthcare company, I don't know what to do about that beyond the basics. Yeah. Like I have an IT department, but we are not an IT company. Mm. So I'm going to have to do something called, you know, get a consultant, right? <laughs> Hire a third party. I mean, that's why God made consultants, right? That Because you're not expected and it would be folly for you to say, no, I'm a mature company, damn it. I'm not getting a consultant. You're in denial. Right? You're in denial. And yeah, I guess that's your choice. Don't get a consultant, but you're going to flail. And you're going to suffer the consequences of that. And then you're going to look foolish. Mm. Instead of going, you know what? I need that. Because maybe I do know what I'm doing in healthcare. Maybe. But I don't know this other stuff. I have to hire a third-party advertising firm. I have to hire an IT consultant. I have to hire a management consultant, whatever, whatever else it is. I have to partner with these other companies. And until I do, unless I do, I'm going to flail. And I think, you know, it's a false equivalency personally and on a personal level to say, to, to connect strength with not needing any support. Yeah. Right. I think we have to send a whole different message. And I think this was like, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think we have to really, really change the messaging that we send to kids, to society. I think we have to change the messaging we send to boys in particular. Uh, you know. So like the stigma is, is more intense with, uh, with boys? I think a little bit. I mean, all of us suffer from messaging and narratives and socialization, right? And, and, and traditionally speaking, yes, definitely women have suffered more from that for sure than men, right? But um, one of the particular ways in which men suffer, I think, is because we are pushed this narrative that we cannot ask for help. That as soon as you do, you are weak, or worse, girly. Yeah. That is something, mm. right? That especially as American men, I think we just... Well, like when we were growing we're up, still, it's like, oh, don't be a girl. Don't, don't be a be pussy. A girl. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's like, it's all these things that are like, like, like the demeaning you, thing. but also demeaning the women at the same time. Yeah, yeah, because like, yeah. what are you trying to say, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I, obviously it makes no sense whatsoever, but we are trained to fear that. Yeah, oh, as men? Yeah. yeah. It's like your manhood. Your manhood. Yeah. Like your cajones or whatever yeah, your we balls say. Are yeah, being right, taken right, away. Yeah. yeah. And like, and yeah. like the the harshest thing you can say to like your friend is like, oh, stop being a pussy. Yeah. Because then they change their behavior right away right once away. you say it. That's motivated because that. yeah. nobody wants that. Yeah, you can call them an asshole, you can call them a, yeah, jerk, a jerk, you can call shit whatever. Head, yeah. Whatever. Nothing's yeah. gonna change them. But once you call them a pussy, all of a sudden he's like, Oh shit, okay. I better change. Yeah, I better change. Because you don't want that. Yeah. Right? And that's I mean, there's just so much wrong with that. So there is the, you know, not only is it sexist, but it creates this environment where if somebody does go, oh shoot, I am feeling something right now that's scary and I don't know what to do with it. It prevents that person from talking to anybody else around him. Mm. Right? They stay silent. They stay silent. And maybe that has something to do with what causes people to say, you know what? I'm going to jump or I'm going to, right? Like take yeah. a gun and I'm going to, you know what? I, I can't. Because I there's can't no one it. else that can help me with this. I there's can't no reach one out to people. And it seems like everybody else is fine. So I'm the weak one. It seems like everybody else is just fine. And I'm the one feeling this inside my heart when actually you're probably not at all. Right. So that's why I speak kind of openly about my own struggles and my own sort of like journey as, as sort of like a, a, a on the other end of the couch, quote unquote, as it were, because um, I really want to put out there that, hey, no, I want to send a different narrative that it is strong. It is strength for you to admit your weakness. You know, unless you admit it, right? Unless you admit it, like there will be, there, there's no help. Um, so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, I'm, yeah. you know, getting personal. Yeah, but yeah. Um, like, what was your experience with suicide like? Like, how, how did you find that light at the end of the tunnel um, and get out of it? Well, my experience in college was the first but not the last. So... Um, you know, um, it is a journey continually to get out of it, right? And it's a journey continually to understand that whatever I'm feeling and going through emotionally, I'm not the only one, right? That there are other people who have felt that, that also that there is hope, 
right? And there's a connection to hope that for me is very powerful. And a connection that, you know what, with um, the right resources, with the right support, the circumstances of my life can change, right? And unless I am willing to admit that I'm feeling this way, I can't, I won't be able to change it. I won't have the support to change it. And I need that support because I don't know how to do it myself or else I would have done it. <laughs> right. Um, so I think it's the connection to hope. And it's a good thing for me, I think, too, that I grew up um, a little bit less buying into this desperado or lone ranger kind of thing. I think I just grew up in a place and with a person, you know, with a, you know, with a structure that um, I had to kind of seek support from other people. I, I kind of had to, maybe because I didn't grow up in like the traditionally, like I wasn't like your sporty guy. Mm. Like I wasn't the, the, the guy that played basketball really well or like, um, you know, kind of w was, was, was any of those things. So I think I grew up pretty profoundly insecure and knowing that I had to um, lean on other people. So right? Was that like your saving grace in a way? Maybe one of them, but also, you know, I'm a religious person, right? And so I, I connect hope kind of on a spiritual level, right? And I think that also helped me because it is, it is easier for me to identify hope or an ultimate hope, right? Um, that is maybe over and beyond necessarily just what we see here on earth, right? But, um, but whatever, but I, I see that as my job right now. Mm. Right. Whether whether a person a person is religious or not, regardless of the 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 circumstances of his or her life, I assume the role of connecting this person with hope. Right. Finding what hope means for that person in his or her own circumstance. Right. And helping them see that they can get there. Right. And whether that's clearing up some lies and this messaging that we talked about before, like, for example, like the, the, the messaging connecting um, strength with not needing any help, I think is only one example of this. But there's many, many lies that I think all of us are subjected to all the time and, and, and forced to believe. And I see it as one of my roles to break down these lies or help somebody break down the lies and break down the effects of those lies in the way that they've been affected, you know, personally. Like these associations we have, mm -hmm. right? And like kind of rewiring, yeah. reframing these associations, be like, look, this is like a bunch of bullshit. Exactly. You know, you need to see beyond that and see it for what it really yeah. is. Don't believe the lies. It. Don't buy into it. Because there's going to be a lot of narratives that are pushed on us all the time from all sorts of places. Yeah. Right. About what we should do or how we should be. What is all this? Yeah. We're bombarded by messaging all every day, every second of the day. All the time about what it means to succeed, about what it means to be a man, to be a woman, to be responsible, to be pretty, to be strong. To like, there's all of these things, and there's a you know, I, I think I see it upon myself, like I said again, to help people deconstruct this, right? To see the effects that it's had on themselves. And to say, no, I'm going to take control of this narrative now, right? Mm. I'm going to take control of it back and I'm going to rewrite it in a way that works in my life, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of these um, messages and these associations, um, you know, have existed for a very long time, right? It's always been around, but like in modern day with the advent of technology and social media and how fast paced everything is and how connected everything is now, it's like taking that mess the, all those message all that messaging and everything we're talking about and like making a potion out of it that's like concentrated yeah. and like injecting it into like your directly into your veins like every yeah. day right because like yeah. everything's through our phones now it's with us every second of the day oh. it's it's always in front of us we're always checking it it's yeah. like we're we're plugged in like yeah. we are plugged in man we whereas really before like we could go out like you know when, when we were like you know, obviously when you were growing up, but even when I was growing up, smartphones weren't invented yet. The, inter oh, no. the internet was hardly even invented yet. So like when I was a kid, when we we're going out playing, like we didn't have phones. We didn't have like if we forgot our phone number, like that was it. Like, oh, like yeah. there, you know, there's no way we're gonna like reach anybody. You oh know yeah, I mean? that's it. <laughs> yeah, we had we used to have these ID bracelets. 
<laughs> or like necklace that would have our name and phone number and address yeah, just in case, you know, yeah, like I really pass out on the no, street. No, no. <laughs> but like you were like, when you went outside, it's like such a, it's like a, such a weird idea now, right? Yeah. To be like that disconnected. But like once we set foot outside our house, yeah, like was we it. were on our own. Yeah. Your mom couldn't like we call were in the, you. Yeah, yeah. Like we're basically quote unquote in the wilderness. Oh, like yeah. there's no way to reach us or know where we are. Yeah. Right. But now it's like, it's I don't so hate different. that. I don't hate that either. Yeah, I don't hate that. But that goes back to like this idea of like, you know, like maybe we're, we haven't we haven't caught up to yeah. how fast society has developed yet, you know, our, yeah. our bodies and our minds. And in a way, I think we are not, yes, you're right, and we are not adapted to it. And I think that's why one of the big, big, I think, areas of research in my field, but also in technology are what are the sequelae? of being so connected. The, the what? The sequelae. What are the consequences oh. of being so connected? What's sequelae? Is that the like, word for consequence? Yeah, what are the yeah, what are the what are the okay. the, the, the consequences or the Making effects? Making me feel dumb here. Sorry, okay. no, 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 <laughs> no, no, sorry, no, sorry. sorry. Joking, no, it's but... a clinical term that I really <laughs> okay, kind yeah. of fall into. But but yeah, what are the consequences of it? Uh-huh. Right? I mean, we do know there's been numerous studies that shows, for example, that social media use negatively that affects anxiety in adolescence. Yeah, right yeah. for sure right yeah. the amount of uh, the, that that as social media in use increases and as social media engagement increases that's correlated with higher levels of anxiety yeah right excuse me for sure and also high, higher levels of, of suicide right you know um yeah p- possibly possibly i think suicide also is something that needs to be understood you know there's not only one reason people feel suicidal yeah yeah. yeah. So I think suicidal is quite multifactorial and it's something that we really, really need to spend a lot more time understanding and something we need to spend a lot more time destigmatizing. So, um, but, but definitely with anxiety, definitely with mood disorders, right? Definitely with things like lack of sleep, mm. right? These are all clear correlations and, 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 um, and being non sedentary, right? Like they say like, like yes. exercise is actually like, if you can like capsulate like all the benefits that you get from exercising, whether it's like anti-aging effects, yeah. uh, mind clarity, metabolism, metabolism, mm-hmm. just like overall health, even down to like the, the rebuilding of your cells, cardiovascular yeah. fitness, yeah. Like if you can encapsulate all that into a pill, it would be like the best selling drug ever in yeah. human history. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. it's like you can't replicate that. Yeah. 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 And and I think for specifically for social media use and technology. You know, there are teams and teams of highly paid, well-trained professionals professionals whose sole mission is to make sure that your eyes don't leave the screen, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And there are people who are, have backgrounds such as mine in psychology, right? Because it's profoundly psychological. We need to make sure that people don't put the phone down. We need to make sure, and I say this not only as a clinician, a psychologist, but also as a person who used to be in sales and marketing, Mm. we need to create in people a need for something that previously wasn't there, right? A desire is not enough. You need to create a need. A desire does not motivate you to spend $1,000 on an iPhone. A need does. You know, you need that. I need that in my life. I, like, I, I need that new need iPhone. That. I need that thing. And not only do I need the iPhone, I need to be engaged in it. Mm-hmm. I need to be looking at the Instagram or the WeChat or the Weibo or the whatever, right? Fill in the blank social networking media platform that we're on, right? And, and it's because teams of people like myself know how to do that. We use variable reinforcement. It's the same thing. It's classic. It's the same reason why people are addicted to slot machines, you don't know. You pull the slot one time, it's random chance. You might win nothing. You might win a thousand dollars. Who knows? And the 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 fact that you don't know makes it fun. Was well, that the reward feedback? The dopamine yeah. dopamine and the serotonin, dopamine effect. The dopamine serotonin. effect. The dopamine effect, yeah. Um, because um you don't know, and so it makes when you do win that that burst. Yeah. And it becomes right. addictive, right? Like you need it. You need it more becomes it. addictive. You do need it, but also it's addictive because you don't know when it's going to happen. If you knew what's going to happen every 20 pulls, 
or even every 100 pulls, and you if you knew, boring. it's boring. Yeah. It's not fun anymore, even though you're still winning oh, every 20th yeah. pull. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah, way. it's 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 addicting because it's variable. Mm-hmm. You might, you might not. Am I going to? <gasps> you know, it's that, mm-hmm. right? And so, and it's the same thing with social media. I don't know, you post however many WeChat moments a day or however many Facebook posts a week. Some of them might get five likes. Some of them might get 200 likes, right? What's the effect of those likes? Ooh, What's the effect of the comment? Yeah. What's the effect of, you know, am I changing? <laughs> am I clicking and refreshing every time just to see? <laughs> Such a rush. Right? Such a rush. How many people are tagging me? Mm. Right? How many people are, right? And I'm not even that, so I'm not that engaged social media in, in social media, but I feel it. Yeah. Like I didn't even get an iPhone until I moved to China. I didn't get a smartphone until I moved to China. So that was seven years ago. That was seven years ago. Wait, when did the first iPhone come out? Oh my gosh. I mean, people were, I mean, I come from the Bay Area where there were like Palm, I mean, people, the, the place is full of early adopters, right? Wow. So like people were using Palm Pilots in like... Blueberries, uh, blackberries. Blackberries, blueberries. Palm, blueberries. Yeah. <laughs> palm Pilots. I mean, from the early 2000s, I think. Yeah, right, I guess. So you yeah. didn't have any of that. I didn't have any of that until 2013. So what were you using before the iPhone? Like just like, like a flip a, phone? Like Nokia, a flip the phone. Nokia phone? Uh, yeah. The Razor, Motorola Razor? I had a Motorola Razor. Yeah, I had, I had a, like a bunch of Nokias. Okay. You know, maybe okay, okay. one of them had like a bigger-ish screen, but mm. like nothing, <laughs> not a smartphone. <laughs> like I was literally yeah. texting people. Like yeah, there's yeah. no, and it was only moving to China that I got a smartphone because obviously you need like WeChat and all that. Okay. Right. Um, but that was the only time. And that was when I didn't get a Facebook account until I moved to China. Yeah. I, I don't use Facebook. Yeah. I'm like you. I don't, I don't, I try, I try to stay away from Kids uh, social nowadays media. Don't, you, don't do Facebook anyway. Well, yeah, it's like, it's out, right? Like no one. Yeah. What no do they one. use now? I like think Snapchat? They do, is that a thing? I don't think, I think it's like a lot of TikTok. Yeah, well, TikTok, but are like, so everyone's just on TikTok now? Or like, it's still Snap Instagram, Snap is right? big. Instagram is still big, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm down with, because I, I see a lot of kids and adolescents in, in my practice. And so I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not that engaged, but I, I'm adjacent to it. So, okay. So in your practice and in your experience over the years, um, what are, what are like kind of like the most common things you see? Here in China, anxiety. Yeah, okay. In the States, a lot more depression. And I, it's a very interesting, I, I think different people process distress in different ways. Mm-hmm. Over here in China, there's a lot more like ang- anxious and anxiety presentation. Is anxiety a precursor to depression? Or you are know, they just completely two separate things? No, I think they're both, they're actually like two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And I think it's really telling if we're to take a, a pharmacological perspective just for a moment, that um, the same first line treatment sort of pharmacologically for both are, are the same ones. They're SSRIs or SNRIs, so right? So the same drugs are used for, for both. both anxiety and depression? Typically, oh, for, wow. for, okay. for first line. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, so really they're, they're, they're two different ways of responding to distress, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think there's a variety of reasons why maybe a lot of folks in America respond with more depressive, um, you know, kind of presentation and why a lot of folks here respond with a more anxious well, what, what's presentation. The, what's the difference, though, you know? I think those two terms get jumped. Like, for people who don't know, like myself, I think yeah. those two terms are almost, like, interchangeable in a way, even though I know they're no, not. No, you're right. No, you're right. But I think to the average person, they throw it around very loosely, like it's, like, kind of the same thing. What are the real differences? Oh, you are asking a very good question. Okay. I mean, Thank I can you. tell you... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can tell you sort of, like, the clinical definition differences, but I think that that's a little boring, right? Like, well, I, what I don't are your, know like, that, yeah, you, so, because you know from personal sure. experience about depression, right? Yeah. So like, what, what is the real difference? So there? depression typically withdraws a person, right? They'll feel something what's called a depressed mood. Okay. And what that means is that it might cause them to have what we call anhedonia, to not find pleasure. It's like a loss of pleasure in what they previously found pleasurable. Is it like a numbness? They might, yeah. It's also sometimes described as a numbness. Also, it can look like withdrawing away from social relationships and engagement, whereas you typically would have, but then you stop. Um, it's, um, it can look like uh, difficulties with appetite or sleep, whether that's sleeping too much oftentimes or sometimes even sleeping too little. 
right? So um, depression can look like a withdrawing or a damping down of a person's functioning. Anxiety can look a little bit different in that it looks like somebody is engaged, but maybe too, but maybe feeling too overreactive, right? Like um, um, they're always worried or they're always nervous mm. or they're always like responding a little bit too fast or too soon or, or, or what we call in, in, in Chinese school, fen, right? Mm -hmm. With a little bit too much. Right. It can also have a lot of physical anxiety, can have a lot of physical correlations, like with gastrointestinal problems, with like itchiness, with headaches, mm. um, with tingling, with muscle tension, things like that. So I, so I yeah. get what you're saying. And now that's clear when you said like kind of both sides of the same coin, because it kind of feels like they're the same thing, but their vectors are going in opposite directions. One is with like withdrawal, removal of yourself. Yeah. And one's like an overreaction. Kind of an over, almost an over engagement maybe. Well, yeah. the way, but the way you um, describe depression um, sounded very mild compared to how I heard it described mm. um, before mm. you know like people have said depression is like just this it's like hell it, 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 it's it's just this unrelenting kind of oh, just yeah. tormenting experience that they wouldn't wish on their worst worst enemies like it's just like complete hell yeah and hopelessness um, you know, because you were describing it more as like kind of the symptoms of it, like yeah. lack of sleep and things like it, that. A, like that, what is like the psychological the actual experience effect. of yeah. it? Yeah, the actual like experience emotional of it experience of can it. be quite hellish. And I've been there, right? It can feel very dark. It can feel like I cannot for the life of me find any meaning, happiness, hope, or joy in anything. And it's scary sometimes because you realize that, okay, I used to find that a lot and now I don't. And that's really scary because that can feel like what hope is there for me then, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. How can I ever feel differently, right? And there's no clear, sometimes, you know, there's no clear explanation, and, and that's really, really scary. And it can feel, and, and, and part of it is that you do feel hopeless. So any sort of attempt, <laughs> right, to sort of like for somebody, from somebody like a friend or a relative to try to get you to see things differently, it just is, is useless. You know, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. It can be very, very dark. And, and the word depressing has this, excuse me, connotation of, kind of keeping and pulling and holding you down. Mm. And it can feel like that. Like there's a force that is either pulling or pushing you down, right? This weight that's on you that you just can't shake. You know, it's like having sometimes like sunglasses that are way, way, way too dark. Uh -huh. And it just is coloring everything that is coming in. It's coloring everything. And no matter what you do, there's no way to take those sunglasses like off. Like you just can't take it out. You can't see it any different. Literally, the stimuli that's coming in is getting colored. Yeah, that sounds, affected. that sounds so terrible. It can be. I mean, there are obviously different grades, right? Yeah, there, of there are such things as being, as being like mildly depressed, right? In which it's like that, but less, you know, less, less so, right? And then also such thing as being severely depressed. And, and it has an effect on motivation, too. Like f people who are depressed feel very unmotivated, right? They just can't get themselves to do anything. And, and, and a lot of times we connect suicide with severe depression, but, you know, clinicians, we see that, that, that the most severely depressed people don't generally kill themselves. It takes a lot of effort to actually kill yourself. It's not that easy to do, right? So that's, it takes planning, heard, yeah. it takes effort. Um, and so a lot of times people who are really, really depressed they're too depressed to kill themselves. It, it takes effort and they don't just, they don't have the Like they energy. don't even have the motivation they to don't have the kill themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I heard, um, I was watching this uh, TED talk before and um, it was, I forget his name, but it was by the speaker who had, um, you know, legitimately tried to kill himself. He tried to mm. hang himself. Mm. But when uh, when he tried to do it, the, uh, the noose that he made uh, broke and he got like all these rope burns around his neck. But didn't die. He didn't die. Mm. Um, and then here he is now giving a TED talk about it. Mm. And he's like you, he was, tr he, he was talking about these very, these very personal experience in his life. And his whole message was trying to destigmatize yeah. um, depression and, and yeah. suicidal um, people. Yeah. And 
he, the analogy that he he made to it was like um you know when 9/11 happened right twin towers um and then you know you you saw people from like um you know they were on the floor that was like full of flames yeah. burning and and there were people that were literally jumping off yeah to their death yeah um so he was equating it like that he was saying like being depressed and deciding to make to to to, to have a suicide it's not an easy decision just like what you're saying is it's like being that person on that floor either you're going to die by the fire or and that's excruciating jumping. or you're going to decide to jump yeah. and die and there's no easy way out yeah. and he he's like and he was talking about like the stigma of like people who commit suicide and oftentimes in society there's this stigma of oh this person was weak uh this person is selfish for killing themselves yeah. right and he's like well you wouldn't call the people who jumped off of the building selfish selfish right yeah cuz you could clearly see the rock and the hard place that they were stuck between exactly yeah you know and it's this idea and when you put it like that i'm like damn okay like if it feels like that like i just can't even imagine you know it's interesting cuz i'm hearing that i i've not heard that that ted talk and 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 hearing that now that really really jives with my experience yeah right like i i really like that analogy really where you see the burning building behind you and you know you're going to die and you see the ground because you're like 80 floors up, you know you're going to die. right? Either way, you know you're going to die. It's just that are you going to choose which one you're going to take? Mm -hmm. right? Because maybe one's just a little bit more tolerable. But yeah. they both have the end result. And I think that for somebody, for, for the person who is making a suicide attempt or, or seriously thinking about it, they see both as having the same result, the same intolerable result. You know? And like... And, and, and I, I'm looking back upon the, the times when I felt that way, I, I, I felt the same way. I felt like if I were to continue living, that would be intolerable. Absolutely intolerable. Yeah, it really highlights how just how tormenting depression actually is where suicide becomes the answer, becomes the relief right where suicide is where hanging yourself is somehow is, tolerable is, more tolerable yeah is yeah. is is actually a, like you know yeah it's better than still continuing to be depressed yeah or continuing to live and again i want to i want to emphasize that not all people who kill themselves are depressed mm. not all people who kill themselves meet criteria for clinical depression although many do mm -hmm. Right. So I don't want to make it sound like, yeah, you, you can't know, like them all. I, I Everyone's. Yeah. So, and I think a lot more research needs to happen so that we understand why people or what are the multitude of reasons that might cause someone to feel like they should choose to die. Well, right. like going back to what you said, it's, it's the idea of hope. Right. And, yeah. and when you're in yeah. that, when you're, I can only imagine when you're in that position, you just you want you you're desperate for hope. Yeah. Any sort of little bit of hope you can grasp onto, right? Yeah. So in your experience, did you just get lucky where you had maybe supportive people around you, where you happened to stumble stumble upon hope? Because when you're when you're in that such a dark place where suicide is a real option for you, yeah. Like how like it's easy to say, oh, just find hope. Like, but how no. like in that position, like how do you? I got, How can you find hope? I got help. For me. So you went. I out got and professional sought help. help. Yeah. I got professional help from a psychologist in my case, right? I, and, and, and I worked with that person. I worked with him to, there's a few, but, but I worked with all of them to kind of change what I was thinking, to kind of change the perspective that I was taking on my life, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, it's interesting because I think that many of us that grew up in, in that, that grow up, we have particularly and narrowly defined, um, ways of being successful or, or having a fulfilling or meaningful life. Yeah. Right. Like there's a certain, there's like this there's one a path certain formula. And one yeah. yeah. There's a certain formula. And when you realize that, man, I don't fit that formula or I might not, it might not happen that way. It can be really, really hard for us to process that other than going, shoot, I failed. Like I had one job and I failed. Yeah. Right. And, and that's obviously not the only perspective to take, but you can get so mired in that, that you can't see it any other way. And in my case, I got professional, I was privileged enough to be able to access professional help to help me see the circumstances of my, of my life differently. 
So it wasn't like changing. It wasn't like becoming an automatic Pollyanna. Do you remember that movie? You're probably too young to no. remember that movie. You have no idea what that is. But <laughs> it's a Disney movie from about this girl that like um, saw everything positively. So it wasn't about like becoming a Pollyanna, but it was about getting a flexible mindset. That as soon as something happened to me that I assumed to be bad, I could actually utilize this different skill, this flexible mindset to take a look at it differently. And as I grew that muscle, right, I began to be better able to view the circumstances of my life with a certain degree of hope. Yeah. Uh, well, when you when you sought help, did you have to? Oh, did I unplug? Let yeah, me plug. No, just give it to me under the table. I'll unplug. No, no, just under the table. I'll plug that back in. There you go. Now your headphones I think, I, I, think I pulled it. Yeah. No, but I was gonna ask you, like, um, like when you sought help, did someone have to? Did someone have to convince you to seek help, or yeah, were you someone, able to just do that on your own? No, someone suggested it to me. Okay. And but I was, took it. And and then you just took it. But I think, and, and that's because a lot of times, but I was I was in a place where I actually took it. And I think that's privilege to some extent, right? Like I was in a place where I could take it. I was, I was in a place where I could access it. Like I, had, I was a college student at the time. So there was like a college student like health center. Like, mm. the, like there aren't a lot of college campuses. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my particular the case, I went to like an outside provider, but I had like an insurance plan that I could use and pay for You know, these are all like um, privileges, right? And I had the time like to get out there to, 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 to their office and, and talk with them and, 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 and do all of this. And these are all privileged kind of like, um, act, you know, resources that, that I had access to, but yeah, someone suggested it to me and I said, you know what? It can't hurt. I'm going to try it. I need someone. And at the point, at that point it was like, I need somebody whose job it is to understand me. Mm. <laughs> Whose job it is, I mean, I don't know that I necessarily thought about it who's, in, in terms of who, whose job it was, but it was more like this person understood me and I could say things to this person that I've never said out loud before about how I felt because I was too embarrassed about what I was afraid of, right? And it's their job to listen and also it's protected, it's confidential, it's legally mandated to be confidential, so he or she and I could like, I could say something and put something out there and we could really look at it and say, okay, that's what you're thinking. Does it make sense? Why do you think that way? Where's that from? You know, are there any other options? Right. And we could really go through this process that I was too afraid to go through myself that I felt like nobody else could help me go through. Cause I didn't want to admit that that's how I felt or thought yeah. to anybody else around me. Yeah. My family, my friend, like I didn't want to admit that because it looked weak. So it's like this idea of vulnerability. Yeah. But it was safe to be vulnerable and can, like because he, he or she was literally legally mandated to keep it a secret. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt like, all right, I could do that. And this is professional. Like I was paying them and you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it actually felt like this was a safe place that I could do that. But it was a privilege that I could have that. Yeah. But yeah. well, how long did the whole process take? Like, I mean, you know, the, I mean, define process, right? In terms of like, once I started to see um, a clinician, I just kind of kept going, you know, different things came up. Mm. Right. And I, you know, I saw a therapist off and on for 10 years before I got married. So it just became part of your lifestyle. Like, kind of became part of like what going to the I, dentist like a resource. Yeah. Like a resource that I would draw upon, mm. you know, consistently. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that I, you know, maybe didn't draw upon like every, every week. Right. But I drew upon consistently and, um, and then continue to, even after like we got married, like I did, you know, totally continue. I, to this day, I see a therapist, you know, a lot of, you know, now my, 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 um, my work obviously is as a psychologist, right? So there's a lot that I have to process through a lot of stuff that I hold yeah. from my typical day that I need help sort of sorting through once the day is over. And it's not always fair to put that on your spouse, right? Put that on your wife. And so, so I, um, I have a therapist that helps me through it. Well, when you go to a therapist, like you yeah. being you, like, do you, <laughs> it, it, are you, are you like, just like, 
I'm George, just a normal person, kind of going to see a therapist, or is there is it inevitable that like you you're you're George, the chief of mental yeah, health, yeah. like persona, like where you pr- pretty much know everything the therapist your therapist knows, right? Yeah, but it's not about knowledge. It's not about knowledge. It's not. It's about the relationship. It's not necessarily that I or he or she knows more about technique. Okay. You know, it, it, for me, it's not about the knowledge. For me, it's about the fact that there's a safe space mm-hmm. that I can look, I can, I, can, I, I can take a thought or a feeling outside of myself and look at it and also gain the perspective of another, of another person who is more objective. Yeah. He or she is not a part of my life, right? But here's what I tell him or her about my life. Right. And, and, and can look at this thing and help me examine it. Right. Because if I were to do that myself, I would be too influenced by so many things, you know, my own fears, my own worries. I can't get out of myself enough to do that. And this person helps me do that. And that helps my mental health because it helps me have a different opinion or perspective on that thing you know, on that thing. And maybe it's not as hopeless as I thought. Maybe I have more strength or more agency or more power in my own life than I was led to believe. Mm. Maybe there's a source of hope here that I didn't see before. And that's powerful. Just that even possibility. Of that, it. Like possibility that, that maybe is powerful. That possibility can pull somebody back from the brink. Because they didn't want to be on that brink or on that precipice because they thought it was fun, Mm. right? They were there because they thought they were forced to, and there was literally no other way. So just the possibility that there might be is enough sometimes, a lot of times, to to go another day, another week, another whatever, right, month, right? And I don't want to make it so dark, but like, you know, I think that's really, really powerful. And that's something that we don't do enough of for each other a lot of times in, in quote unquote normal life because of stigma. Like how we you socialize know? and how we communicate yeah. with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't want to seem weak. Yeah. And we don't want to burden other people. I guess more so with you know? guys. Would that I be think like so. when you're interacting with guys? I think so. Like at the risk of sounding controversial and having all the women I know kind of come, come at after me. you. <laughs> but like girls, but girls like, like to talk. They, they, they like to, they like to talk, right? Like yeah. all, every girl I know, like loves to chat with her, with her girlfriend. Sure. They can chat for hours and hours sure. and hours about like all their personal stuff. Sure. But it's not often that, you know, guys are more like bros. Like we're bros, yeah. you know what I mean? And you're not really going to open up with each other as much. No. Especially maybe a lot of like, I don't know. It could be more of an Asian thing too, as well. Maybe there's something there, but I think guys are just guys, right? Guys are always just more guarded, and and less wanting to be um, or threatened by vulnerability, right? I think that I think you, I believe you hit the nail on the head. They're threatened by vulnerability, right? That we are socialized to view the possibility of vul- being vulnerable as threatening to our ego. Mm -hmm. Right. And like a lot of times, like us sitting across the table right now, having, you know, talking to each other, I think is a rarity for guys. Girls do that all the time. They sit across from somebody, from their girlfriend or whatever. Right. And they talk. (laughs) Girls are podcasting all the time without knowing they're podcasting. (laughs) Not even knowing. Guys, they're sitting like next to each other, you know, a lot of times, Mm. like doing something else. Right. In a triangle shape. Right. Yeah. Where like you and I might be sitting next to each other, but we're doing we're playing a video game or we're doing something like over there. Yeah. Right? And then maybe talking as we're doing it. But like our attention but is only split. with the attention yeah. on something else, because it's a little uncomfortable like this. Right. If it, it feels vulnerable. Yeah. And I think we're conditioned to feel threatened by that to some extent. Right. And, 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 and I think that I think that we're a little bit lesser for, um, believing that messaging you know that that we're that 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 we um you know that we suffer for it a little bit like research the psychological research shows us too that as men and women old age they are different in um their levels of socialization so as men age the the amount and the the amount and quality of social relationships usually declines whereas as women age it usually increases hmm. right 
And so that's very, very interesting too. Now, obviously, statistically, men die earlier than women as well, right? Just physically speaking. But, um, but men typically decline in the number and the quality of relationships as we age. That's true. Like yeah. almost every, including my father and like yeah. all the elder Think people about the I older know, men. like they just don't have a lot of friends anymore. Yeah. You have their wife maybe, yeah. right? If they're but, still married or whatever. And maybe like a couple other people, like their family. Yeah. Like maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Like, but but like, their buddies, yeah. their friends. But they're not like, yeah, they don't have a lot of people. No. Whereas a lot of times women are the opposite. Maybe they're still involved like in the community or in social, social circles, or they're still like, you know, going out and having coffee or Yeah, for sure. Like my mom, Mm -hmm. she's like, um, she does like, she does like these salsa dances. Sure. Like she's out there. She's getting out there. Yeah. She's part of all these like WeChat groups and everything. Like, yeah. And does it have some effect on life expectancy? I don't know. You know, but maybe. Definitely, maybe it has some effect on subjective satisfaction and quality of life, mm. for sure. Yeah, well, social connection right? is the biggest factor, influencer of, uh, of happiness, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Subjective happiness and subjective satisfaction. Absolutely. And, and we as men are not socialized to invest in relationships. We are socialized to invest in our own power, right? Our own ego, our own like sense of accomplishment and skills, which is not a bad thing, right? They're, they're great. It's, it's, I'm pro skill sets and pro, you know, advancing (laughs) ones. But, but, but we're not necessarily socialized all that much to, to in, in the relational sphere. And I think we suffer for it. Yeah. Well, what do you, what do you see now? Because I feel, I don't know how accurate this is, but I feel, um, in Western cultures and in America and Europe, um, there is recently more of a willingness and open discussion and more dialogue going on around mental health. Yeah. Um, you know, you see it everywhere. You, you, you see it in schools. You see it when you turn on ESPN and they're talking yeah. about like athletes going through like mental mental issues, yeah. mental uh, health issues and stuff like that. So there seems to be more of an awareness of... In, in like putting in place like a uh, mental health uh, resources for yeah. people yeah. at all levels, yeah. Um, whether it's in government or in education yeah. or wherever, right? Agreed. Um, is there anything like that going on here in China, where there is more of an awareness of mental health? There is a more of awareness of implementing mental health resources for people, yes. young and old. I I, I would say so. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know that it's nearly as, you know, we're at a different stage in de- of development in terms of this field here in China, for sure. But um, but there there are, especially post-COVID. Mm, yeah. I think COVID has also, you know, obviously it's brought to light many things, but one of the things that's brought to light is mental health and the amount of the amount that people struggle with mental health, right? And how important it is to make sure that mental health resources are available and accessible. So conversations around online platforms, right? Distance platforms, stigma, you know, is it right that for much of mental health here, we still require people to show up at a hospital or a clinic before they can get really good quality mental health treatment, right? Um, Or how, how quality is that mental health treatment is another question, right? But um, here in China, there have been actually a lot of online platforms that have been operating for, for quite a few years and, and that really exploded post-COVID. Um, what people don't also know is that as here in Shanghai, but also in Beijing and some of the other cities, that there are hotlines that people can call that operate both in English and Chinese, right? Um, run by Chinese institutions and also international NGOs. Right here in Shanghai, there's Lifeline, right? Not just here in Shanghai, Lifeline operates using a, a toll-free 400, 400 number, you know, in all of China, but they're based here in Shanghai. Um, and they're English only, but there, there are a, a whole host of Chinese language resources too that run 24 hours a day. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask yeah. you because um, when it comes to mental health, because I know like, um, you know, people like you and there are other, um, you know, like real Westerners yeah. that come in that are, that are part of this. So I wanted to ask you like, it, are, are, is the mental health discussion, quote unquote discussion yeah. being had here and uh, movement and help, is it predominantly um, more populated by people from international Western backgrounds like yourself or 
are are the locals and, and local resources and local doctors are are they the ones just as much or even more a part of that as well? Yes, they're a part of it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. They're the main conversation, yeah, okay. right? Because us operating here in the international sphere, even people like you and I who kind of can operate kind of with one foot in each in each domain, um, you know, we are only just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the actual kind of populace here, right? And so um, in the Chinese community, definitely the conversations are happening. Unfortunately, I think that in the Chinese community, there still is... Kind of, an, kind of an old way of thinking about this that is profoundly psychiatric, like thinking about mental health in terms of mental illness, right? Which is a great topic, which we should discuss because we want to bring down the levels of mental illness. But I think that we need to have the discussion way before things get to the mental illness kind of stage. So when you say mental right? illness, is that like bipolar, schizophrenia? Is that, Men, is, no, that what, is that what it is? No, mental illness in terms of like depression, okay. anxiety. But also including bipolar, schizophrenia, anything, post-traumatic okay. stress, acute stress, adjustment problems, you know, all sorts of things, right? But I think we want to talk about what supports mental health, what supports good adjustment, mental adjustment, before it gets to the clinical phase, mm, right? Before, before somebody needs to serious. see a doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think we want to back way up. We want to have these conversations about how can we support good mental health um, among students. So it's more schools. about prevention. Yes. Than treatment. Or early intervention, right? Early, before it gets to like the clinical level, right? Mm. So what does it mean to support good mental health in a, in a school for students? What does it mean to support good mental health in a company for the staff and employees? What does it mean to promote a good mental health in families, right? Uh, in churches, in wherever people go to gather, right? How can we how can we promote good mental health in these places and start the work there before people get to a place that they feel like they have to go to a hospital, you know, they feel like they have to present to a clinical encounter, right? Because that's going to have much more stigma attached to it. Yeah, and yeah. then at, also at that point, I would have to imagine there's um, only so much you guys can do. I mean, you can do a lot of things, but at that point, it's, it's well, could, you're really the, treating an illness at yeah, that point. Yeah, and now we have a resource question, too. Yeah. We have access questions. We have all of these things, right? So I'm really passionate in my work about pushing mental health, quote-unquote, intervention way earlier and pushing it out into the community, right? I think that's really where we have to start. And we really have to honor and recognize the fact that people are connected to their communities, right? So the more that we can promote and utilize existing community structures, the better, the better that it will be for like our mental health as a whole, as a society, you know? So I do a lot of um, school-based work. I work with a lot of school-based people. My wife is a school-based mental health person herself. Um, you know, I work with companies. I want to be able to address these things and to promote healthy ways of living from the mental health perspective, healthy ways of living, you know, generally. Well, yeah. that's that's a beautiful purpose to have in your life and a mission, yeah. man. I yeah. mean, yeah, like I really appreciate what you do. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, mental health is something that we kind of always mention on the show. Yeah. Um, but we never really got to sit down with someone like you to really kind of talk about it. Um, yeah. I've talked to other psychologists, and we, we've talked about anxiety uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know David Amersleger. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I had him on as a guest, and that was a fascinating discussion as well. Mm -hmm. um, but today with you, it was very different. Um, but before we wrap it up, um, I do want to ask you, because you mentioned uh, the, you know, about the quality of care you're getting as well, because yeah. that's obviously a very important factor when yeah. you're seeking help. Um, is that something that has to do with what you're doing with uh, the Shanghai International Mental Health Association? Yeah, it does. So you know, can, what, what's the mission with that? So the mission is, is actually multifold, right? One of the things that we have, we call it SIMHA, right? Shanghai International Mental Health Association, SIMHA. One of our missions is to really help the community understand what they're looking for and what they're getting when they access a mental health clinician, right? Mental health is a part of healthcare that here in China, at least, is not regulated very consistently or very well. I think that here in China, when you access, you know, when you try to access an endocrinologist 
or a gynecologist or a dermatologist or one of these other specialties, right? You can go, and as long as you go to a hospital that is pretty you know, reputable, you can sort of trust that the person you're seeing, whether it's a dermatologist or a gastroenterologist, like that they've had a certain amount of training and they more or less generally know what they're doing, Mm -hmm. right? They probably went to an accredited institution and got licensed via the the formal kind of way, right? And so you can have a certain level of trust in, in this person, right? Mental health sometimes is not is a lot more mysterious, particularly in the international space, mm. where you have people that are coming from all around the world, right? They're coming here and they're calling themselves whatever they're calling themselves, counselor, psychotherapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, and maybe me as a general, you know, person from from the community, I don't even know what the difference is between these terms. Well, right? are there like, a lot of know. bad players as well? You know, there are some. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and I, won't, I won't say bad, bad players necessarily. I think that the terms mean different things in different places. Like, for example, the word psychologist, right? Coming from where you and I come from, that term is regulated. You can't call yourself a psychologist unless you have a doctoral level degree in a psychological field, mm, okay. right? That's the only way that you can use the word psychologist. There are some exceptions, right? School psychologist is a little bit of an exception. But basically, you can't call yourself a psychologist unless you have a doctoral degree. And you can't call yourself a clinical psychologist unless you've been licensed by one of the 50 states. Because you can have a degree but be not licensed. Because to be licensed, you have to go through all this training. You have to take tests. You have to do all this stuff. Oh, it's like being a lawyer, right? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. It's like graduating with a law degree versus being a member of the bar, for example, right? So, except that for for us, like for me, I'm licensed in California and Hawaii, and in California, we have to go through 3,000 hours of supervised clinical training and pass two tests in order to be licensed. It's a lot, 3,000 hours. It's a lot, it's a lot. And one of those tests we have to, you know, pass with like scales, we we have to pass with the 70... 70th percentile or larger or higher. And the other one we have to pass at 90th percentile or higher. So it is quite, it's a high bar in California. Um, So anyway, so that the term is regulated, but it's not regulated everywhere else. Like for example, somebody can call themselves a psychologist, but be from the UK that has a very different definition or be from Romania or Italy or Brazil Mm. or Cuba. Right. And so now we all end up here in Shanghai and the consumer wanting to find a resource goes and it's like, oh, this is a psychologist. What does that even mean? Mm. Right. So part of Simha's mission is to deconstruct that for the consumer. And what we also do is we verify, we attempt to verify in, in where possible the credentials of our members. Wow. So yeah. if you find a um, a person who is a Simha member, then you know that there's there has been another set of eyes on this person's credential. Right, they're not just coming from wherever they're coming from and saying, "Hey, I'm a like they've psychotherapist." Been audited, they've been kind of. There's at least another set of eyes, okay. right? Now we are not like a legal entity. We don't take responsibility for a license or anything like that. But what we do is we try to verify that license and try to make sure that this person who says they're an X from wherever they're from actually is an X from whatever they're like fact they're from. checking. Yeah. Yeah. So you, we can, you can be reasonably assured that at least another set of eyes has tried to do that for the person that you are, um, that you're trying to access. Well, I think that's great. Yeah. I, yeah. I never, like, once you say that, it's like, yeah, of course there should be something like that, right? There should be some sort of, like you say, another set of eyes, some sort of standardized bar where you're like, sure. you're held to, right? And we're not the standardized bar because everybody comes from their own country where there probably is a standardized bar. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, sometimes not. Right. Mm -hmm. It can be very variable and I think surprisingly variable for some people. But um, but at least, you know, that somebody else has has taken a look at it, too. And also um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come out with something on our website that um, defines all of these different terms for the general consumer and defines like these terms in context of where that person is from. So the word psychologist, for example, you can take a look at what psychologist means in the U.S. versus what it means in the U.K. Mm. versus what it means somewhere else. Wow. Yeah, Yeah, that's really great. It kind of demystifies it a little bit, clears everything up. Yeah. And yeah, wow. I think that's, it's kind of like, I equate it to like um, 
being verified on Twitter or being a verified on Twitter, right? Because like <laughs> a little bit, yeah, like yeah. your verified official account, right? Yeah. Like, this like the blue is check, you. yeah. yeah. Like, if this is Kevin Hart's like page, like you know, it's actually Kevin Hart's page, yeah, and not just other person pretending to be Kevin Hart, right? Exactly, kind of like that. Exactly. Wow, that's great, man. Yeah, that's great. How long have you guys been doing that? So we've been doing that uh, over ten years now. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we're really proud of what we're doing, and 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 uh, and we we hope to keep keep improving the service that we we do for the community yeah. well george thank you for your time being here thank you justin this I, was a wonderful conversation i really thank you enjoyed for sharing. it absolutely thank you and uh let's do this again sometime yeah let's do it yeah i'm serious yeah this was a great conversation yeah. there's so much more we can talk about there's a lot more right there's yeah. because this is this is the 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 great and non-great thing about this whole mental health issue is that it's never ending yeah you know what i mean and there's it's an ongoing mission there's there's the work is never done and it's going to constantly evolve. And as the way I think things are playing out here, especially post-COVID, like you yeah. pointed out, um, this there's more of a need for it now more yeah. than ever. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one, an interesting thing that might be tangentially related, but, but not really, I think is like you and I's experience as ABCs, not only growing up in different parts of the U.S., but also that the complicated relationship with our ABC identity as we come back to the country of our sort of like cultural heritage. Oh my God. I need, we right? need to have another podcast. We need on to have this. another podcast. Do, do, can you come back and talk about this yeah. at a future date? Because that is something I've always thought because, um, I mean, I'm just going to mention it really quick and yeah. we can, we can save it for next time to be continued. Right. Yeah. But I, I've been going through that personally. Oh yeah. <laughs> like the way, like my, my identity, um, my feeling of identity, my feeling of, Jeez. um, where my home is, that yeah. quote unquote home, yeah. my, my my national allegiance and 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 just views and perspectives is all twisted up right now. It's totally. it's completely changed. Totally. Where now, um, whenever before, obviously before COVID, when I went back because I've been in China for so long, when I went back to the United States where I grew up, I felt like a complete foreigner. Oh, I know. And a lot of that might just be in my own head, you know, the way I'm, you know, kind of kind of interacting. With yeah. The, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't shake it. This feeling of like I just felt everywhere I went, like I'm just foreign, alien. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I just felt like I was such a foreigner. Yeah, yeah. and that in some way I didn't belong. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I still haven't figured it out. But yeah. it's a very, it's an isolating feeling, and it's confusing. You know, it's really interesting because I think there's a, there's a growing body of research focused on what we call TCKs, right? Third culture kids. Ooh, so third culture kids are um, people who grew up in a culture that's not their own. Like, for example, a lot of like um, dip kids, diplomatic kids, right? They're American, but they grew up all over mm -hmm. going to international schools in like Italy or in Russia or in China or wherever, mm -hmm. right? And so they grew up like American but not necessarily connected to that identity, mm -hmm. right? And so they grow up in a in a uh, with an identity that is not connected to their passport, nor is it connected to like the place that where they're at geographically, like China, like or their Italy. actual daily experience. Yeah, right? and it's like something else. It's this third culture, right? But I think that what you and I are talking about are is it like a very particular type of third culture where we grew up from an immigrant kind of like place in the U.S. And now we're migrating, we've migrated back, right, to sort of this, 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 our, our sort of country of our own cultural heritage. But we didn't grow up here. Yeah. And we were born here and we weren't, we didn't um, necessarily grow up mired in what, it, in, in the culture and the history here, right? And it's a very particular type of third culture, I think, that's really fascinating to talk yeah, about. Yeah, it is. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, is there a lot of research about on this third one? culture generally, but not on what we're talking about? Really? Yeah. And I think that'd be really interesting to explore. That is fascinating. Yeah. I started to write about it a little bit recently. I haven't pub published anything, but um, just on my experience, you're right. And what you talk about, this very complicated relationship with my opinions about China and America, right? Yeah. You know, having had one foot now in both for, for a while yeah. and growing up with an identity that I was forced to have, like in, growing up in America, I don't know about you, but for me, I was forced to take on a hyphenated identity because I wasn't always viewed as just American enough. Yeah, like, I had like a similar a experience um, where I grew up in a place where, well, 
in a community where there really wasn't too many Asian kids. Yeah. And especially within my circle of friends and at my school, I was literally like one of the only Asian kids. Wow. So I grew up with all non-Asians. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I was the only ones, which at the time I never, I ne- never thought about. Like that was never a thing that I thought consciously at the time. But there was always this feeling of like, like, I don't know, this weirdness, right? Yeah. Like I almost felt like the token, right? Like yeah. token Asian kid. And especially like with confronting like white girls, you know, like, yeah. like it yeah. was like this extra sense of like nervousness of yeah. like male, Chinese, enough? Asian I male identity. Enough? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was like, it was weird. And I, I never could put my finger on it Yeah. Um, until much later in my life. Yeah. yeah. And then coming back here and I still remember and, and also feeling foreign here yeah too yeah right and i remember when i was you know you know like i said before i first moved to Beijing. we first moved to beijing when we came to china and i was working for united family there they recruited me but we had to go through a licensing exam in beijing right because the beijing health bureau had to give us a license and we went to beida we went to peking university and part of the licensing exam was paper and pencil which we did and then part of it was an oral presentation in which i i i, I sat at a table like this in front of like six old men <laughs> right who are grilling and they gave me a little like kind of paragraph and they asked me to read the paragraph and kind of give my opinion about that clinical case mm-hmm. right they grilled me and then one of them was just like hey tell me about you why are you here with and i talked about my experience growing up as a chinese american but back then i didn't have a command of chinese enough where i was nuanced in describing myself i said growing up as a zhongguozhen i used the term zhongguozhen mm-hmm. Right. And the guy stopped me. He was like, you're not a Zhongguozhen. Ooh, that must have stung me. And I was bit, like, right? what do you mean? Like, I was confused. Like, I'm not a Zhongguozhen, so I don't know what you're talking about, right? And he was like, no, you're a Huazhen, but you are not a Zhongguozhen. You're a Meiguozhen. Mm. And I was like, oh, the conversations we could have about this, yeah. but I'm going to leave it alone, right? Because I know where you're going with it. But I was like, oh, that's an identity question that is complicated. That is really complicated. But what he was saying was, you are not under the administrative jurisdiction of Zhongguo. Yeah, well, he so, was talking about yeah, legally. Yeah, like legally. But it just opened up this like... Well, that's such a good, that's such a good uh, point because like growing up, well, us growing up in, in the States, like when we say like we're Chinese, we almost exactly. meant it eth- like ethnically. Like we mean Chinese American ethnically or yeah. Chinese American. Yeah, yeah, when I say like, oh, I'm Ch-, like when people ask me, like, oh, I'm Chinese, like obviously I'm American. And we say when Zhongguo, I say that. we don't say Huaren. Yeah. Right? We say Zhongguo. Yeah, because I'm like a Chinese, like, yeah. and it was more like an ethnic thing. Like I'm yeah. Chinese, I'm yeah. Chinese descent. Yeah. And that was like understood. But coming over here, it was not. It was like, you're not a Zhongguo then. Yeah. Like you're clearly foreign. Yeah. Right? And And that was like, and and it was this this thing about like what Zhongguo and Hua means, right? Because like I grew up, yeah, using that term Zhongguoren, like at least in Chinese when I spoke Chinese, yeah. which was a long, you know, significant amount of time, you know. But yeah, something to explore <laughs> yeah. in a we, later in a later conversation. We need to we need to have you back on and yeah. do this again. Yeah, then. let's do it. But cheers, cheers. Thank, Thank you, you, George, for Thank coming you. on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was a great mm. time. Um, do you have anything? Again, the whiskey is good. It is very good. But you've been, like, I guess within character, you've been nursing that, that one glass. I'm trying to not be, like, buzz while would, would I... You, would you get drunk if you finished that glass? I don't think so. No? Well, although but I had a glass... you've never been drunk before, so I would No, know? I haven't, but how would I know? And I, 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 had, a, I had a glass of scotch over at Stephen Young's place uh, yes, before. Yes, you did. Yes, you even did, though yes, it was 1130. <laughs> And I said, it's 1130. And he was but that's like, how he rolls, man. Yeah, that's he was Steven like, rolls. I'll do it. If I was like, okay, I'll have some. Shout out to the Shades of Yellow podcast. Exactly. I was just talking to Steven when you mentioned that you were there before and we were laughing over text messages. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He's, I'm like, you beat me to the punch, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Do you have anything? Are you working on anything, like any books or do you have any talk engagements um, coming up? Yeah, I have a lot of talk engagements coming up. Like I, one in particular is coming up um, in November, which is the um, Shanghai international mental health association training day and this year we're doing it a little bit different and we're partnering with tec which is the expatriate center Mm. so the expatriate center and simha are partnering to put on a mental health awareness event featuring um, speakers from all different kinds of mental health disciplines and also a panel discussion and the theme is going to be um, finding hope in a changing world and i think that this is something that we're gonna it's a big topic now after covid 
obviously, but also, you know, because our, our world is, is changing, you know, in so many ways, right? And yeah. it can be quite tumultuous for many people. And so we want to help people find, get connected to hope and resilience. Well, I think that also very well sums up a lot of the things we talked about today as yeah, well, Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. So when, when is that? Uh, event? So that's uh, Saturday, November 14th. November 14th. Is it open to the public? It is. Okay, great. For free. All right. Uh, anything else? No. Any books? Oh, oh, well, yeah, I'm Should actually working book, on... I'm I actually, encourage all my guests to start writing thank books. You. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually co-authoring a... Or I'm, I'm authoring a chapter in an upcoming publication on international mental health. Okay. And so I'm going to be... Um, I'm in sort of like the outline and design phase of a chapter focused on psychopathology and, and the presentation of symptoms and disorders um, in different cultural contexts. So more to come for that. Yeah. Once again, for the third time, George, thank you for being thank on you. the show. Thank you, Justin. All right, Have guys. Uh, I'm Justin. That was George. We love you guys. Peace. Be well. Take care.